everybody. First of all, I would like to thank you for attending the course. My name is Alphonse Perez. I work in ODG, Observatory in the Type in Globalization. ODG was created in the year 2000 and is based in Barcelona. So it has more than 15 years of experience working on depth and energy as well. I've been reading uh, all your applications and letters and I see that there's a lot of uh, diversity in terms of uh, geographic diversity, but also on background diversity. And I see, I really see that on, as an opportunity to share off a different point of view. And actually what I'm going to do today, I'm going to do it right now, is to share Odegi's point of view on the EU energy policies. As we have just four weeks to work on that, um, I will really focus on what we think is more relevant on the EU energy policies right now. So I won't do like the historical process that why we are here in, or why the situation is like this right now. So let's start the presentation. So the index has just these four points the EU double dependency, the energy union strategy, projects of common interest, and some criticisms, criticism that um, some of the NGOs and organizations are doing to this energy union strategy. So the EU has this EU double dependency, so from uh, fossil fuels and imported fossil fuels. Um, the EU energy union strategy is how the EU is acting and reacting to this double dependency. Projects of common interest are the physical part of the strategy. And then we will see that all this sphere has some criticism, as I said before, from uh, different NGOs and organizations. So in this first slide, if you have a look in this graph, you will see that more than three quarters of the primary energy in the year 2013 in the EU are from uh, fossil fuels. And then, if you have a look in the table, you will see that more than 50% of these fossil fuels are imported. So, EU energy policies has a lot of to do with this external dimension of imports, EU imports, ensure the EU imports. We can see more detailed information in, the, in this slide. So for solid fuel imports, that means all types of coal, let's, let's call it like this, the leading uh, supplier is Russia. And actually, if you have a look in the historical process, you will see that Russia has been very important, especially from the year 2000. And we have showing you how, how the imports are increasing and now they are quite stable. But anyway, let's keep that in mind that Russia is leading the fossil fuel exports to the EU. And if we have a look in the petrol, petroleum products, we have again Russia leading the exports to the EU. And if you, we have a look in the historical process, we see almost the same, that Russia has been always very important and now it's quite, quite stable. And what about natural gas? So we'll focus on these three, uh, the, the three fossil fuels. Natural gas, again, we have Russia leading with 39%. I didn't say that this is the year 2013. And if we have a look in the historical process, again, we find Russia that has been always a very important exporter of gas to the EU. So, in order to summarize these two slides, we have Russia, uh, as you may know, uh, a very important and the most important energy supplier to the EU. But let me go back for a second. If you have a look in here, this gives us 
a very important information as well. Other suppliers for uh, coal, let's say coal, are 3.2%. And other suppliers from the non-EU countries are, for in terms of uh, oil, are 18%. But then, with gas, we have just more, less than 1%. What does it mean that? It means that there are not uh, a lot of gas um, exporters. So, in oil, the EU has a lot of uh, different um, oil exporters. So, let's say that the oil is quite diversified. Coal is not that much diversified, but what I really want you to keep that in mind is that the gas is a, like very, 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 uh, just very few countries in the world are uh, able to export gas because of its own nature. You know, gas is not easy to transport, so you, you can just build large pipes and gas pipelines that are quite uh, expensive. Or you need to do like um, liquefaction plants that are more than 10 billion dollars, and then you need to have regasification plants on the other side. We will talk about it later. Then we have this picture, this reality that the EU is dependent on uh, gas, oil, and coal from Russia. But I mean the the key point here is the the Russian uh, the the EU depending on Russian gas. So I this map showing you all the gas pipelines that are crossing Ukraine. Actually, there's all the uh, gas pipelines that are crossing Ukraine and um, Belarus as well, coming from Russia. But if you see here the amount of uh, uh, different uh, gas pipelines that are crossing Ukraine, you will realize that Ukraine, as, as you may know, is a very important transit country. So the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has uh, very important um, impacts in the, um, in the gas supply, especially in the EU 13 countries, member states. So in the year 2006, um, Gazprom or Putin or um, yeah, uh, decided to cut off all the gas supplies that were crossing Ukraine. So, and as a result of that, uh, there was a very big problem of supply in the, the EU 13 member states. So, and the EU was reacting, trying to to organize uh, organize. So we have uh, Russia uh, leading the coal, oil, and gas exports to the EU, but actually, the most important one, as I said before, because of this um, this difficulty to diversify. Uh, gas suppliers. The most important one is natural gas. So you know that the the, the problem of the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine has a lot of to do with the the EU energy policies. Actually, in the year 2006, uh, Gazprom or Putin decided to cut off all the gas supplies from all these gas pipelines that are crossing Ukraine and feeding. Um, a, um, EU 13 member states. So, and, and it caused a very big problem of supply, of gas supply in the very winter, in the very middle of winter in the EU member states. So, the EU react to that and said we have to, we have to diversify uh, natural gas uh, suppliers. We have to look to another places in the world to, to bring gas to the EU and we have to definitely as, as Marko Sekovic said in this, uh, in this sentence, uh, we don't have to accept the, the, that Russia is using gas as a political weapon. That's why the, the concept 
or what a bit what what there is behind this uh, idea of general union is try to 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 uh, to diminish uh, the Russian influence on energy uh, issues in the EU. So this strategy, the energy union, uh, as I said before, is trying to act and react to this dependency on uh, natural gas from Russia. It actually, at the energy union, has a wider approach, has these five pillars, the security, solidarity and trust, the build of an uh, internal energy market, the modulation of demand, decarbonization of the energy mix uh, and research and innovation that's uh, that are the, the five pillars of the energy union but if you have a look in the in what is going on uh, on the ground and what are the um, the most important um, things and what are the political discourses uh, focusing on you will realize that these two pillars that are in red, security of supply and the internal energy market are the most important one. Big percentage of uh, funding, big, big percentage of political discourses are focusing on these two. And this, if we, if we can just summarize all the energy union strategy in two words, one is diver diversification. As I explained before, we need to diversify from, from gas exports from gas imports from the from Russia, and another one is integration. We need the member states to, member states to be more integrated. So we need like national um, national grids integrated, national electrical electric grids and gas grids more integrated between the different um, member states. So. Um, as I was explaining to you in the index, there is a there is a like a physical part of this strategy. So if we need to diversify, we need to find another places in the world to bring us to the EU. And if we need to integrate, we need to build new gas pipelines and new very high voltage lines that will interconnect all the member states. So that's this map. Is showing you the proposal of the projects of common interest. As you can see here, uh, blue lines are very high voltage lines and red lines are gas pipelines. In total is a list that more than is around 248 projects of common interest. As you can see here, 132 about electricity. 107 about gas, gas pipelines, and but also regasification plants and compression uh, facilities, and seven uh, related to oil. So then, you, if you want later, you can check this uh, link, and you will see all the details for for the projects of common interest. So the EU is projecting all these uh, large energy infrastructures. Um, as a part of the energy union and one of the, the things that we're going to do in the course is analyze few of these the more problematic controversial projects that are being proposed by the projects of common interest yeah the slide before was showing you infrastructures like gas and electricity infrastructures and here you can see all the new projected uh, LNG terminals uh, if you are not familiar with the um, gas production and transportation LNG terminals are the the terminals that are allowed to receive these bezels these gas bezels with the methane with the natural gas in a liquefied form with minus 162 degrees um, and they they do the process like they they are able to do the process to, to 
change to from the li liquid uh, natural gas to the gas you know? and they are like injecting gas to the gas pipeline so um, if, if you see here there are 22 existing LNG terminals in the EU and there are six under construction that was from the February of 2014 but are 32 new planet or understudied uh, um, LNG terminals so that means that the EU is really uh, trying to as I said before diversify and to give, give chances to different countries in the world to bring us to the EU in, term, in, in a liquefied form and if you have a look in this graph you will see that actually in the year 2000 we, the EU has a lot of uh, big um, LNG capacity but most of the capacity is unused so as you as you can see uh, there is a uh, like a big uh, offensive on in terms of liquefied uh, gas uh, but also in natural gas in, in uh, coming with pipelines to the EU and this is another thing that we have to we will see in more detail in the second model this is the and uh, what we say the the hidden transition because uh, gas is traded in the world in different forms uh, historically uh, gas was traded like with bilateral um, contracts between exporting countries and importing countries so they agree for it with uh, long-term contracts so I me um, I don't know, Spain uh, wants to buy some gas from Algeria not, not the country I mean the companies like Gas Natural wants to buy um, gas from Sonatrack so they agree for a, for a volume of gas, big volume of gas, with a price indexed to, to, the, to the oil price. So it, it has a pro proportional price of the oil price. And these uh, contracts are for, I mean, for 20, 25 years, something like that. That is what historically, how, how the, the gas was historically traded. Right now we have like some places in the world that are trading gas um, with a pu pure spot market like the US. The US is yes uh, offered on demand uh, so the pure spot market for the trading of gas. In Asia, Asia you have like a mix, no sorry you have just um, most of the, the most of the gas trading is with uh, this bilateral contract that I said before and the EU is actually moving from one uh, model to the other one so as you see here in the year 2002 80% of the gas traded in the EU was uh, oil indexed and now just in the year 2015 just 51% so what does it mean that that the model of trading is changing and the EU has um, a big focus on this transition to a spot market so the the gas market I guess let's put it like that is not really globalized like the oil market that it has like a still regional regional um, markets why? Because this, uh, because of the uh, the nature, its nature, for the, uh, the gas nature. It was quite complicated to uh, to transport, and it was really expensive. And it has uh, a, a lot of expensive technologies in order to export them and to import gas. So there are still some regional markets, but the EU and also the US is pushing for this spot market and it has impacts in terms of uh, financialization but let's let's leave it like this and let's go deep on that on the second model because it's quite difficult to explain so now I'm just done with the with the strategy of the EU energy sorry for the energy union strategy so and let's see some of the criticism about it 
First of all, some people say that this is not an energy union strategy, it's actually a gas union strategy. Why? Because it's really focused on gas. It's, uh, gas was the main problem and now gas is the main solution. And of course, political discourses, sorry, official discourses on saying that the gas is the, the climate friendly fossil fuel. But if you take into account, yeah, that's true that if you burn gas instead of uh, gasoline or coal, the emissions are lower. But if you take into account all the chain or the commodity chain from the production to the use of the, the gas, and if you take into account the leaks of gas, you realize that there is not this big difference between different between gas or coal. Here you have the you have the different um, emissions in terms of um, um, fossil fuel burned, but then if you have a look in the methane, because uh, natural gas is on is almost uh, a big percentage of methane. Um, if you have a look in that, you will see that actually the global warming potential of methane is 72 times to this. Uh, um, uh, related to the uh, CO2 in the first 20 years. So, if we want to, if we want to say uh, that the natural gas is a is a climate friendly fossil fuel, we have to justify all of this, and we have to have a look at all the chain and the commodity chain. Just keep that in mind: the commodity chain, the gas commodity chain. Because some of some studies says that there there are leaks about uh, three to five percent of the in the traded volume of gas uh, is leaked. So it's it's not a big percentage, but with if you multiply that for seventy two, you will realize that it's quite important in terms of uh, climate change. Another big critique is how the energy union is is funded. Uh, because, as the European Commission said in the October of 2013, the upgrading of the existing and developing of new energy transmission infrastructures of uh, European importance will require more investments. Uh, will require investments of about 140 billion in electricity and 70 billion in gas. So this is more than 200 billion of uh, um, investments. So how is the EU um, how is the EU preparing that? Um, just to explain in an easy way is putting like like a, a pot of um, public money in order to attract investors. So that's why the, there is this uh, connected Europe facility. This is a an, an public fund with five. Uh, 0.35 billion euros. There is the Juncker plans that we can talk about in the second module as well with 315 uh, billion euros. There is actually uh, this, is, um, this is the final amount, but I mean there's tw 22 billion euros of, of public money that is uh, aiming to attract uh, investors and it's, it's aiming to attract these 350 uh, 15 billion euros and it's also using problematic i would say financial instruments like project bonds initiative so if you are if you are familiar with the castor project that uh, is it was uh, uh, built in the is a, a geograph uh, geo, geological um, gas storage in spain this Castor project was financed by the Project Bonds Initiative, partially financed by Project Bonds Initiative. So this is a way of uh, deepen uh, financialization, or what we call the financialization of infrastructures. But as I said before, we will uh, talk about that in the second in the second part of the course. And one important thing, or what I think that is really important, is if we have a look in this sentence, this is part of the strategy, sorry, the state of the energy union and that, uh, that uh, this um, document was released in the November of 2015. 
he says that as a, a matter of priority, the Commission will work on schemes uh, to integrate the small energy efficiency projects. Why? Because this uh, pot of public money that is aiming to attract investors, actually what it's doing is financing only large energy infrastructure. And if you have a, like a small program locally based for energy efficiency or from some renewables, these big investors are not interested in that. So they need to find these schemes to aggregate uh, small energy efficiency projects in order to be financed. So that's one of the criticisms as well, because on this um, um, financing um, schemes are really um, benefiting big uh, and large energy infrastructures, but also big and large energy companies. Another one is the maybe the, the most controversial PCI, Project of Common Interest, what is called the Southern Gas Corridor. There is a gas pipeline that is coming from the Caspian Sea until Italy. This gas pipeline is, has a budget around uh, 45 billion euros and it has more than 3,500 kilometers and is actually connecting um, the economy of Azerbaijan with the economy of the EU. So there is an exchange of gas and euros. And there are, as you can see here in the slide, there are like some of demonstrations and people is really well organized against the, the gas pipe here in La Puglia, in Italy. And ODG and another organizations where we visit Azerbaijan in the year 2014 and we interviewed some people about the problems of human rights and democracy violations of, from the, um, from the uh, ALIES uh, government. Actually, there's, here is uh, his, uh, Ilham Aliyev. These four pictures from Intiga Aliyev, Leila Yunus, Khadija Smaliyova, and Rasul Jafarov, these four uh, friends and colleagues that are working in Azerbaijan, were detained and were jailed with fabricated uh, um, accusations. And they've been, now they are, uh, fortunately, they are released. And, but they've been more than a year in, in, the, in the prison because they just uh, have, I would say, a critical uh, point of view of the um, uh, Aliyev's regime in Azerbaijan. So that's another way, that's another um, thing that we want to highlight. So we really question if the EU has to have uh, this energy diplomacy there is saying us, telling us that Russia is the bad guy. So we're finding new good guys like the like the Ilham Aliyev regime in Azerbaijan. So what else? Um, this is the last slide. Uh, so we we criticize as well this word dependency. What does it mean dependency? we are talking about a physical dependency or we are talking about economic dependency because if we analyze and we go to a, to a disaggregated data and we have a look in the for example the netherlands uh, oil supply we will see that the netherlands has a dependency a very high dependency on oil 94.95 percent but if we have a look, we see a big volume of imports and a big volume of exports. And if we actually look at where the uh, Netherlands are importing from and where the Netherlands are exporting for, we realize that the Netherlands are importing a lot of oil from Nigeria, but also exporting oil to Nigeria. So what is dependency? Um, what I want to highlight here is that the, the advanced capitalism uh, is doing this kind of exchange of low, low um, cost uh, raw materials and uh, importing raw, uh, low cost raw materials and exporting added value uh, materials. So actually the Netherlands are importing 
crude oil from Nigeria and are exporting gasoline to Nigeria. So this has to do with dependency, yes. Uh, not the Netherlands are dependent on um, the economic process that, has, that is behind that, but not actually from the oil itself. I'm sure that you get what I want to say. And that's it. I really hope that uh, the presentation was uh, helpful. Um, and uh, I hope um, we can discuss it in the spaces that we have in the, in the online course. So thank you for listening and gracias por la vuestra transición. And see you next time.